What's up everybody? Welcome back to my channel. If you are new, hey I'm Sydney. Every single Thursday I sit down and I talk about a crime, a cult, or a conspiracy. If you find that interesting, please be sure to like, subscribe, and tell your friends because I'm here for you every single Thursday. Okay, oh, by the way, let me backtrack on that as well. Um, please be nice to me. <laughs> Be nice to me. Last time I wore my glasses in a video, somebody commented that it looked like John Lennon. Don't do that again. Just like, you know what, mind your business. No one asked. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you watched last video, I accidentally hit the microphone because I talk with my hands a lot and the microphone, I'm picking up slowly. The microphone's right here. Okay, oh shoot, I'm already, I'm already messing up. Back to True Crime Thursdays. I know a lot of people have been messaging me and been waiting on this for a long time. Um, I too have been waiting on this for a long time because I was supposed to be done September of 2021. I first posted my, I think I, I think I posted my first True Crime video of September 2020. So, since there's 50 states, it should have been done at least by September 2021. I'm just now on M's, and it's 2022. If y'all haven't seen all my videos, y'all know I needed a mental break, and I went through a lot of moving last year, and whatever, bada bing, bada boom. If you've been following me a while, you know. If you haven't, go watch those videos so that you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, today's video, um, I need to give a pretty short uh, viewer discretion is advised to this video. On this channel, I don't think that I have really covered anything as gruesome as today's case. Um, I probably have, at least to me, all the other videos, I'm not downplaying that they were not as good because that would be awful. True crime is for entertainment and research purposes. It used to be for research and um, just kind of like news, I guess, but now it's come into a form of entertainment. Please remember that these are real lives, human lives that were taken away. Don't comment that one story wasn't as gruesome or interesting or whatever. All of it is awful. Like I said, just be mindful of that. This story does involve a very gruesome and graphic description of a crime scene. It also involves with like sexual assault, abuse, rape, and if that's something that you just can't handle right now, please be kind to yourself and be kind to others as always. Okay, so without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and jump in to Skidmore, Missouri and the disturbing background of it that leads up to today's case of Lisa Montgomery. Okay, let's get started with today's case. This is Crimes, Cults, and Conspiracies with me, Sydney. So this town is Skidmore, Missouri. This is where today's case takes place. Today's consensus uh, of the population doesn't really even consider this place a town anymore because there's less than 200 people in Skidmore, Missouri. Pictures of Skidmore show that it is a very old, dusty type of ghost town. And when I say ghost town, I actually mean ghost town. There's been a lot of disappearances, a lot, a lot of mysteries, and a lot of deaths that have happened in this town. This town has a very dark and long history of disturbing and violent crimes. It was actually a man named Ken McElroy that had bullied this town for a really long time. He was so terrible that like even the police were afraid of him. He had done so many horrible things from rape, different assaults, arson. He would steal livestock from a bunch of different farms and just a lot more. He was kind of known to do all the crimes in the book. He had pushed so many citizens to the point that they were completely done with him being bullied and around 50 of these townspeople had cornered him and crowded him and they shot him and no one knew who shot first. So basically this town is known to get away with murder because since they didn't know who shot first, the police weren't really worried about who killed somebody that had caused so much stress in this town. Nobody was really charged for it or even went to jail for it. So um, that just kind of starts off with how this town goes. It's almost like it's cursed. But like I said, this is not the most bizarre and dark thing that's happened. Today's case that takes place is way more dark and sinister than that, and that is the murder of Bobby Joe Stinnett. Bobby Joe Stinnett was born on December 4th, 1981, and she grew up in a town called Graham, Missouri. Bobby was known to love horses and she loved dogs. She was a big animal person, and she was very, very, very kind to every single person that she met. 
Bobby eventually ended up marrying her high school sweetheart. His name was Seb, and they got married, and after they had graduated high school from Nodaway Holt High School in 2000. Bobby and Zeb found out pretty early on after they had gotten married that they were expecting their very first child. Well, um, since everybody knew everybody in such a small town, the word quickly got out so everybody knew that they were expecting their first kid. Everybody knew that Bobby and Zeb were pregnant. Bobby, Joe, and Zeb had owned their own dog breeding business and she also worked at a manufacturing plant too. She didn't just do the dog breeding business. This was kind of like a little side gig that they had. This dog business they named Happy Haven Farms and it was, like I said, a dog breeding business. So Bobby would actually post on the internet whenever she had new puppies available. She was a part of this one online group that was, you could like online chat with each other and it was called Ratter Chatter. And this is where she met a lady named Darlene Fisher. Ratter Chatter was specifically for rat terrier dogs and Darlene had mentioned to Bobby Joe that she was very interested in one of her new puppies that she had. So Bobby Joe and Darlene were messaging on this group Ratter Chatter. So since Darlene had showed interest, Bobby Joe was like, oh, hey, great. Yeah, you can come by and pick out your puppy. Here's my address. And so they had scheduled a time to meet up um, so that Darlene can come and buy a puppy from Bobby Joe. They were messaging in 2004 on December 15th, and they had actually scheduled the very next day on December 16th for Darlene to come and pick up a puppy, pay Bobby Joe, and go home with her new puppy. Bobby Joe's mother, her name was Becky Harper, and she just one day decided she was gonna go check up on Bobby Joe and see how she was, cause Bobby Joe was eight months pregnant at this time. But little did Becky know that whenever she would go to check in on her daughter, she would enter the most horrifying scene that she had ever seen in her life. And she immediately called the police. On the phone with police, she had explained that it looked like Bobby Joe's stomach had exploded. That is how awful this scene was. Bobby Joe was sadly pronounced dead at St. Francis Hospital that day. I think you can all guess exactly what had happened. Police had actually sent out an Amber Alert for a red Toyota a red Toyota Corolla in hopes of finding this unborn child. But of course, because this was completely unheard of, people were hesitant to send out the Amber Alert because how do you know what an unborn child looks like? They know it's a baby, but it was very hard because of course this is nothing like they had ever heard of before. So like I said, you can probably guess by now that the baby was taken out of Bobby Joe's stomach and that is why the Amber Alert was issued because Bobby Joe was found without her baby and everybody knew that she was eight months pregnant. Like I said, this is an unborn baby. You don't really have a description. Um, we had the description of the car that people had seen leaving Bobby Joe's house that day, but other than that, we don't have any other thing to go off of. This is an unborn baby and an unheard of case. At Bobby Joe's house, law enforcement had come to the conclusion that there was no forced entry. So Bobby Joe was either expecting somebody that day or had an unexpected guest come by that she knew, but it showed that she had been strangled with a rope and she had fell unconscious, but she wasn't dead because of the rope. So Bobby had actually put up a huge fight because they found a wad of dark blonde hair wadded up in her fist, which shows that she had put up a fight. Um, and along with she had blood all over her feet, which, sorry, um, it basically showed that her stomach, she was, she was still alive after the baby had been cut out of her because um, blood had poured all over her feet from her, I guess, her standing up. She had cuts on her hands and abrasions on the side of her head and on her nose. So the official cause of death showed that it was by strangulation. So maybe, you know, whoever the perpetrator was had went back and retried to strangle her, but her womb was open and she probably lost a lot of blood as well but her official cause of death was by strangulation. I'm assuming that the rider chatter was open to the public because there's a lady that phoned into police that she had seen Bobby Joe messaging a lady named Darlene Fisher and they had planned to meet up so that she could get a puppy. So maybe Darlene Fisher had something to do with this. Police obviously didn't have any leads at this point so they quickly searched the IP address from where this message had came from and it did not come from a lady or it did not come from a house owned by a lady named Darlene Fisher 
but it came from a home that was owned by a man named Kevin and his wife, Lisa Montgomery. But this wasn't in Missouri, it was in Kansas. Kind of jumping for a second, we can all guess by now Darlene Fisher is not actually Darlene Fisher, she had a fake name. It was by Lisa Montgomery. Earlier, this um, tragic murder happened in December of 2004. Earlier in that same year, in April of 2004, Bobby Joe and Lisa had actually met at a dog show and they had expressed their love for dogs and had even spoke in ratter chatter with Lisa going underneath her actual name, Lisa. Her and Bobby Joe had spoken ratter chatter before. Bobby was very early on in her pregnancy and Lisa had explained to Bobby Joe that she too was pregnant. So that was another thing that helped spark and continue the conversation besides their love of dogs uh, was that both ladies were pregnant. On December 17th, police had drove to Kansas to Lisa's house and they spotted a red Toyota Corolla in the driveway and this kind of helped them make some connections, but they didn't want to jump ahead too quickly, but they were very suspicious of what they were about to go into. When they go inside to Lisa's home, Lisa is holding a baby and the baby has a very small cut over its eye, but Lisa said that this baby was named Abigail and she had just given birth to this baby. So the day before, on December 16th, whenever Kevin saw that Lisa was gone, um, Lisa had explained that she drove to, it's not funny, it's just, it's awful, I'm just confused of how people can make up such a big lie and then end up getting caught. It's like, just go ahead and tell the truth. Just tell the truth, please. Lisa tells police that the day before, which was the 16th, um, the day that Bobby Joe was found tragically murdered, she had drove into Topeka, Kansas and had given birth to this baby, but Kevin was not present at the time. And he did tell police this as well. And she had given this inf the same story to Kevin a day before. Why would you not have the father of the child there with you to have the baby? Kevin told police that he was not a part of this birth, but he did have to go and pick her up in Topeka at a Long John Silver's after she had given birth to this baby. So while police are pushing this interrogation, Lisa cracks but changes her story, not that what she had done to Bobby Joe. She said that she didn't have the baby in Topeka, but she actually had the baby at home. And she took the placenta and she threw it in a nearby river. And that is why there's not a whole lot of bloody evidence. I know it's gross, I'm sorry. Police were very confused with this because if you had had the baby at home, then why did you drive to Topeka whenever your house is in Melbourne, Kansas? Why would you drive to Topeka, Kansas with the newborn baby to then have your husband come pick you up in Topeka to bring you back home? Like it wasn't adding up obviously and police were just kind of, yeah, this lady is very suspicious. So they took her back to the station and this is where Lisa finally confessed exactly what had happened. Lisa explained to police that she was speaking as Darlene Fisher underneath that group ratter chatter with Bobby Joe, and she had made the 130 mile trip two times. One was the day before the murder, and then one was the day after. The day before the murder was just a test run to see where exactly her house was. She then tells police that she did strangle Bobby Joe with a cord and that she had, before the murder, spent hours watching at-home births and at-home C-sections so that she could take the baby out of Bobby Joe. And this was horrifying, obviously, to police. And police that were, that had arrived on the scene of Bobby Joe said that they were still traumatized because that was one of the worst scenes they had ever, ever come across in all of their years of work. So Lisa had named this baby Abigail, but after they had returned the precious baby back to Zeb, he named her Victoria, and Lisa Montgomery was charged with first degree murder of Bobby Joe Stinnett and kidnapping. So who the hell is Lisa Montgomery and why did this woman commit such a horrifying murder? Well, it's actually a very, very, very sad upbringing story. It's very, very awful. So just, again, be cautious. Lisa Marie Montgomery was born on February 27, 1968 in Melbourne, Kansas. Lisa's mother, Judy Shaughnessy, 
She drank really heavily while she was pregnant with Lisa, and Lisa said that she grew up in a very abusive household. While Lisa's mother was pregnant with her, she drank really heavily, um, which caused Lisa to have permanent brain damage before she was even born. Lisa's father's name was John Patterson, and he had another daughter from a previous relationship or marriage, and her name was Diane, so the two were half-sisters. Lisa's mom, Judy, was very violent and very abusive to both girls, especially Diane. Diane explained in a later interview that Judy was very abusive to her. Um, she would beat her with anything that she had in her hand at the time or in close proximity to her hand, and whether that was like a belt or a broom, um, and then she would also like poke her in the chest over and over and over in the same spot, but it wasn't just for like fun. It was supposed to be hurtful and be really, really hard to end up leaving a bruise. Judy was so awful that on one occasion, just to punish the girls, she ended up in front of them killing the family dog with a shovel. Diane explained that Judy would find whatever hurt you the most and she would use it against you. Like for one time, Judy knew that Diane had a like a really bad abandonment issue because of her mom leaving, her actual birth mother. So she stripped her naked one day and shoved her out on the front porch and locked the door, it made it seem like she was being kicked out and that no one wanted her. And she used that as a punishment and Diane explained that that was very, very traumatizing. Judy also would invite random men um, over to the house sometimes and they would get into physical altercations. Their dad, John, was away at the military, so basically an affair. We don't really know, like you don't need to have all these men over, but since they would get physical, Diane was four years older than Lisa and she explained that she was a protector over her. Even though the girls were both very young this was happening, Diane was very protective over Lisa. She didn't want her to be a part of all of this chaos. Judy would get a male babysitter to watch the two young girls and one incident whenever Diane was only eight years old. While Lisa was laying in the bed, the babysitter at the time had taken advantage of her in the bed. While Lisa was laying in the bed as this happened, he didn't touch Lisa if I read correctly. Diane actually had CPS come and take her away and she believed this was like her saving grace, but because she was so protective over Lisa, she was so worried about what would happen to her. And I don't really know why they didn't take Lisa too. I don't, I don't know why they took Diane only whenever they should have taken both girls out of the home for both of their protections. But I don't know, I, don't, I couldn't read why it said that they only took Diane from the situation. Diane was placed in a foster home that really did show her a lot of love and affection like a child should receive, but Lisa was still stuck in the home and if they had only taken Lisa after they had taken, or with Diane, if they had taken Lisa with Diane, what is to come wouldn't have happened. No one was there to protect Lisa anymore, and Diane explained in a later interview that she had not seen her sister from the day that she was taken until Lisa's trial 34 years later. When Lisa was in kindergarten, Judy had remarried a man, and then they went on to have three more kids together. Jack was known to be a very violent man and very abusive, and it was to both Judy and his kids. And whenever he would abuse the kids, it had sexual undercurrents to it because he would make them strip down completely naked before he would whip them. In Lisa's early teen years, Jack had moved the family to a small town in Oklahoma, but Lisa said that this was very common because by the time that she was a teenager, they had moved a total of 16 times in her life. This house in Oklahoma had a small shed um, on the outside of the house, but it wasn't for normal things like tools or like yard work, like chainsaws and stuff. It was specifically his little torture chamber for Lisa where he would start to rape her every single day by the age 11. This was an ongoing thing, like I said, almost every single day. It even got to the point where his friends would come over and help him on the house and doing yard work or painting or whatever. And instead of him paying them, he would offer up Lisa and that would be their payment. Like you get to rape my stepdaughter and that is how you, like, like a thank you or your payment. It is 
awful because this was not just one extra friend. This was multiple friends from her stepfather. Lisa had confided into her cousin, who was the deputy sheriff at the time. She explained that there were men who would come over and, uh, like, every single day rape her vaginally, orally, or anally, and it would be over and over for hours and hours and hours. And what did this police officer do? Absolutely nothing. Keep in mind, this was her cousin. She also explained that they were very physically violent with her and explained to her if she was doing it wrong. So after they were finished with her, they would beat her up, urinate on her, and then they would leave. When Lisa was 15, Jack and Judy eventually and finally divorced. And during the divorce proceedings, Judy had explained that she actually knew that Jack had been molesting her daughter and she had walked in on it happening one time. And her exact words, she explained, he was in her, he was pumping her. What Judy failed to mention was that whenever she had first seen this happen, she actually threatened her daughter by saying that she provoked her husband to do this, to rape her. She is the cause of this. And she didn't just threaten her, just like, I'm gonna beat you up. She threatened her with a gun to her face. Her own mother. Since this was never reported to authorities, even though it was, even though it was, the judge basically just harped on them for being really bad parents, which they were, but nobody was charged for this. I did read, I don't know if this is confirmed or truth or what, but I did read that Judy was actually the one that had trafficked Lisa to those men, but it could have been both of them, I don't know. Um, either way, both parents are like really messed up in this situation, so I'm not saying that it didn't happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if she was a part of it. Lisa was court ordered to go and seek therapy, and which she did, but the therapist didn't really help the situation either. All of these people who were meant to protect her did not protect her. This therapist let this go and reported basically that Jack had beaten her so hard with a broom one time that it broke. So once this had broke, he just started using his fist to continue beating her. This story is so unbelievably sad. It's so, so sad. Now, I am currently getting my master's right now in psychology, and I found this interesting because we had actually, earlier this semester, had went over disassociation. So I'm gonna add this in because um, she ends up being diagnosed with it. Sorry to let you know, but um, in response to traumatic events, children were actually, children, I mean, some adults do this, but children are more known to it. Children were actually disassociate from their physical bodies in the middle of a traumatic event and go to a place that's like their safe haven or their safe place. It's basically just like a protection blanket to obviously protect them from what is happening in the current moment. And this is exactly what happened with Lisa. She took her safety blanket, and because this happened over and over and over, she disassociated so much from this constant assault that she ended up developing the disorder. Because her trauma was so frequent, it was almost like a normal state of being for Lisa. So at the age of 18, Lisa had married her stepbrother Carl Bowman, and they went and had four children together. And after her fourth child, she had to undergo a sterilization pr procedure. I think it was involuntary, but a lot of friends said that after this, Lisa's health started to deteriorate. It was also known that Carl had been forcing Lisa to have sex with him, and there was actually an alleged home video of him raping her that people explained to be something out of a horror film. He had constantly been physically violent with her so she had not escaped this from her childhood it went on into her adulthood too like she had not known peace or calm at this point and i'm just like lisa had been in such a rough state that she could not keep a steady job she was constantly getting into car accidents she would neglect her kids and she would drink really heavily and she even she even started to engage in sex work too 
just to help pay for the bills. So since she had disassociated so much when she was a kid, it actually furthered into adulthood. Her kids said that she would get into this trance or this disassociation and they could not snap her out of it unless they called her Martha and not mom. I don't know where Martha comes from, but that is how they would get her to snap out of it. So even though Lisa had went through the sterilization procedure, she would still tell people that she was pregnant because she enjoyed the attention that she would get whenever she was pregnant. So even though she had went through this procedure, she had made up all these elaborate lies, and Carl knew that she had went through this procedure, so she, he was just kind of like, okay, um... I don't know why you're doing this, but you can't be pregnant. So Carl and Lisa get a divorce in 1993. Then they remarry in 1994, but then it officially ends in 1998. I don't know. I don't know. But this is where she meets Kevin Montgomery and she moves into his home that houses him and his three kids. Lisa and Kevin end up getting married in the year 2000 and she had proceeded to tell Kevin that she had been pregnant multiple times, even though she wasn't because she couldn't be, and her last due date was supposed to be on January 16th of 2004. So like I said, obviously she wasn't pregnant and whenever these babies weren't coming, Kevin would be like, hey, what's going on? I thought you were pregnant. And she wouldn't just make up like things like, oh, I had a miscarriage or something like that. She would say like really messed up things like, oh, I drove to another state and I got an abortion or um, I ended up having the baby, but I didn't want it. And so I just donated the body to science. She would make up some bizarre, bizarre things, not just saying that she had a miscarriage. I don't know. So that kind of ends the story of her life. And this kind of ties in with what the story was earlier about what happened to Bobby Joe. Um, and now this is going about this, I'm kind of jumping ahead basically is what I'm saying and we're going to look at the court case and leading up to the court case now. So Lisa's defense attorney was assigned to her and his name was Frederick Duckard? Duckard? I don't know. Listen, I'm so sorry. I'm really bad with names. I'm so sorry. Okay, I know. I'm sorry. But he was a very good criminal defense lawyer and so he was assigned to Lisa's case. Um, but the day that they were supposed to meet up, he explained to Lisa that he was too busy, so he sent his wife to go speak with Lisa before the trial. So this lady had no criminal background, or not criminal background, she had no law background. Um, she was an occupational therapist, and she owned a lot of horses, and she would do different types of therapy with autistic children with horses, so she had nothing to do with law at all. I just, that, I mean, that's not super important to the case. I just found that interesting. Why would, you, I don't know if that is allowed, you know? Can you do that? Are you allowed to send someone else who has no law, ba law background to your client to speak with them about an upcoming trial? She had no idea what she was doing. So the way Frederick was going to go about Lisa's case was that he was going to say that Lisa's brother Tommy had actually went and stole the baby and killed Bobby Joe um, for Lisa, but when Tommy heard about this and knew that that was the route that they were going to take, he actually had a solid alibi because that day he was actually meeting with his probation officer, so he had a very good alibi. Also, why would you pin that on your brother who had nothing to do with this? I don't know. So since that was out of the question, now the strategy was to try and prove Lisa not guilty by reasons of insanity. Lisa's defense team was going to try and convince the jury that Lisa was suffering from PTSD, depression, borderline personality disorder, and phantom pregnancy, which would have caused her to not be in a healthy state of mind at the time of the murder, which could help their case of not guilty by reasons of insanity. There was a forensic psychiatrist named Park Dietz that was hired on the prosecution's team as an expert witness. Keep in mind, this guy was on the Unabomber case and on the Jeffrey Dahmer case. He basically explained that Lisa's diagnosis um, was not real science and could not be admissible in court. So, concluding the case in October 2007, Lisa Montgomery was found guilty for the first-degree murder of Bobby Joe Stinnett. 
and she was sentenced to death on October 26. Of course, whenever people are sentenced to death, they do try to appeal it, and that is exactly what Lisa did. Lisa, after the trial, underwent another psychosis testing, and this is where they concluded that Lisa was suffering from a extreme dissociation from reality, PTSD, bipolar disorder, and permanent brain damage. Lisa's defense team had failed to look into her traumatic history and make that comparison. After a long battle of Lisa's appeal to change her sentence from death penalty to life in prison, she was scheduled to death on December 8th of 2020. However, this was delayed because Lisa's attorney had actually tested positive for COVID, so they had to reschedule it. But on January 1st of 2001, the judge ordered a state of execution due to it violating the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution regarding cruel and unusual punishment because Lisa was known to have intellectual disabilities. The Supreme Court overturned this immediately, and they even said that immediately she needs to be put to death by a lethal injection. Lisa Montgomery passed away due to lethal injection on January 13th, 2001. She is the first female federal inmate in 67 years to be executed by the U.S. federal government. So, um, hold on. How do we feel? Do we believe that Lisa was the victim and the perpetrator? Or do we think that she was a victim who was failed by every person that's supposed to protect her in her life, if they would have done the correct thing at such an early on age, this would have never happened. Like, what do we think? Because my heart absolutely is broken for Lisa, but her cousin, who is a cop, who is supposed to protect her from this, didn't do that. That's his job. Not even as a cousin, but his literal job. I just think the justice system is ungodly up because she went to therapy that therapist didn't say anything that judge totally let both parents go by i mean i think that's going to be it for me today guys if you enjoy my content or enjoy true crime content i do post every single thursday so please be sure to like subscribe and tell your friends because i'd love to have you here okay Thank you so much for watching, thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you next Thursday.